Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Eric and I like to read and today I'm going to be doing an author interview. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to Barnaby Walter and this is Barnaby Walter. I believe on my screen he's above me. <laughs> um, so Barnaby, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, um, my name is Barnaby. Um, I write under the name BP Walter and I write psychological thrillers. And my most recent thriller is a book called The Dinner Guest, which um, came out in Canada earlier this year and came out in the UK last year. And I actually have it to hand, isn't that perfect? This is the Canadian edition Ooh. of, um, of The Dinner Guest with a very nice cover. Um, I believe there was an export available for a while, potentially of the UK edition, or the ebook might have the UK cover, but I will show the UK cover just in case. But, that is the um, the UK cover. Ooh. So um, it will be one of these if you discover the um, book. But um, yeah, it came out in the UK spring last year and then it was published in Canada in this edition earlier this year. It looks super ominous. <laughs> <laughs> Bad things happen. Yeah, especially like the UK one looks more ominous, I think, than like our yeah. version. Yeah, I think it's the... Um, I think it's the the circle of blood in the um, in the middle. Is it blood? Is it red wine? <laughs> that that is the question. So, how about you tell us a little like synopsis about what the book is about? Mm. So, the dinner guest is about, um, as you can possibly tell, there is a crucial dinner within the book, and um, the book starts on this on this very evening, and um, it's in an affluent house in Chelsea in London, and there is someone dead at the dinner table. And there is a guest there, an uninvited guest. And this uninvited guest named Rachel, she phones the police and confesses to the murder of one of the people at the table. And she absolutely did not commit the crime. And the other people at the table are completely shocked as to why she's potentially confessing to a crime she absolutely did not commit. And we then go back in time to find out how the main central couple in the book um, got to know Rachel how she kind of ensnared her way into their lives and um, how we got to that terrible day um, when um, one of them was lying dead at the at the dinner table um, so yeah that is the central the central idea behind the book well, that sounds super intriguing I'm very <laughs> like invested now I need to know what's gonna happen <laughs> here um, yeah that sounds very exciting so you said that you write psychological thrillers primarily correct that is correct yes that is awesome because I love psychological thrillers. Um, what are your other ones that you have written? Well, um, in terms of, I always get a bit shaky as to which ones are published where, um, <laughs> but um, I am, I'm lucky that my debut um, was published in Canada as well. And um, it came out in the UK in, it's hard to remember. I find the pandemic kind of steals my whole sense of time, but um, it, was the, it was the year before the pandemic. It was in um, February 2019, my debut came out, and that was called A Version of the Truth. This is the um, Canadian cover of that. And um, yeah, with a uh, rather ominous looking woman peering around the corner there. Um, but yeah, that came out in 2019, and um, that's a similar um, sort of in tone in, in terms of it set in a, um, in a posh part of London. And um, um, there isn't a murder in that one, but there is a very dark conspiracy that, um, that, that goes down. And then my second book came out, probably in the worst possible time a book could possibly come out, which was about four weeks into lockdown. And um, that was called Hold Your Breath. I don't actually have the Canadian edition of that one, but I have the UK edition. And I believe the Canadian cover is practically identical. But um, yeah, that was that one, Hold Your Breath. And this one is, I think, the closest so far I have stepped into sort of horror. It's, it's, it's a psychological suspense novel, but it does knock on the doors of horror as well. There are exorcisms. So um, yeah, That's this one's set in a, a dark, mysterious forest in north of England and um, narrated by a 10-year-old girl called Kitty. And yeah, it's, it's quite different from the others. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed writing this one. And um, my book after that was The Dinner Guest. And the one after that, which has come out in the UK here, but it's yet to come out in the rest of the world, is The Woman on the Pier, which is this one here. Ooh, um, okay. And my fifth book, The Locked Attic, comes out autumn this year. So um, Very yeah, that exciting. Is, that is an entire rundown of my, my, my backlist. You are just I'm like pumping books. out books right now. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, I did two. There was two came out last year. It was going to be three, but in the end they decided to, um, to shift it to, um, to, 
three across the space of I think about a year and a half. So not not quite as um, James Patterson as it could be. But yeah. um, <laughs> did you did you find that with the pandemic you had a lot more time to write? Mm, it was interesting actually because um, to some extent my time um, shrunk because simply because I was around more people because. When it became, I used to live in London, um, in and um, in central London, and when it became clear that the UK was heading towards a full national lockdown, I um, before it was imposed, I quickly moved back to my family home just outside of London, simply because I didn't fancy spending the whole of lockdown alone. So um, mm-hmm. I was suddenly around my family and spent a lot more time around them than I um, um, than I did when I was um, living in London. So um, I probably, to some extent, had less time to write in the nicest possible way because I was. Yeah. Um, spending a lot of time with them watching the news and the, um, the horrors unfold really but um, I think I was very lucky in the sense I've always been a few books ahead of my publishing schedule so if ever I do have a downtime it never really causes much of an issue because um, at the moment I'm writing books um, seven and eight and book five comes out this autumn so that gives a sense of how how far okay. along um, I am in terms okay. of them um, so I'm very lucky that I've never to some extent written to deadline if that makes sense um it's it's more that um they're kind of waiting there on the hard drive for when um, the publishers need them right on so i guess that jumps into my next question and if you don't mind me asking are you traditionally published i am yes and published by harper collins in the uk us and canada very cool i do like i do a lot of um book reviews and things with harper collins canada so that's awesome oh they're, wonderful. Yeah. they're a great company yeah i love them Cool. Okay. So I have some more questions that are more just about you as an author and your kind of like reading tastes. So let me just look at my notes here. Okay. So my first question is what has been your top read of 2022? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I did have a pile of books right next to me that I've recently read. Um, As soon as I read a book, I put it on a pile either to give to like my sister or friends or something like that, um, or Hmm. to, um, to pass on to charity shops i'm just looking at the um pile of books i've just finished a really really good book um a thriller by adrian mckinty called the island and he wrote a book called the chain a couple of years ago um which wasn't his first book he'd written a number before that but that one went really really big and um, i believe the island is his follow-up um it's not a sequel it's another standalone um and i finished that this morning and that was incredible i mean it's dark it's pitch black dark I was not prepared for how dark it um it got but uh yeah I think that was extraordinary and um if I can pick another I'd say Don Winslow's novel City on Fire um that's a thriller but it's more kind of gangs and um um, gang warfare kind of um kind of big city kind of sprawling novel but um yeah that really stayed with me so um off the top of my head I'd say I'd say those two but there were probably tons more that I could talk for hours about (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah I kind of catch authors off guard with that because they're like oh I've read so many books I have to think about this <laughs> um that's really cool though like I've actually heard about the island it was one of my books I think in one of my videos I put out it's one of the books that like I was excited for that were coming out because every month before well the, the month before I'll like look up books that are coming out and put a video of like books I'm excited about and mm-hmm. that was one of them because the synopsis sounded really good for that book so yeah it's it's really good tense is the word for it okay awesome so like that that makes me want to pick it up even more so speaking on that um do you primarily read thrillers or like what are your favorite genres to read i i'd say and this is a very unscientific rough estimate but (laughs) i'd say it's probably about 70 percent thrillers and 30 maybe you know 30 to 40 percent um other genres i tried to read a as wide a variety of fiction as I can. I, I gravitate towards the dark stuff more than the light stuff. Um, but um, I, I would happily read, you know, rom-coms or romance or fantasy or science fiction. It's just, um, I think, because thrillers is the is the genre I occupy, mm-hmm. I kind of like to view, and this is in some sense um, me allowing myself to carve out the time for reading, but I sort of view reading in the same way an Olympic athlete would view the training. And I think in the past, I gave myself a hard time for reading that I felt like I wasn't working. Whereas mm. I had to kind of shift my mindset and think, no, reading is working. 
and in some sense that like if we use the analogy of an athlete an athlete wouldn't just view the race as the as just the job they'd also view the training as part of it as well Mm -hmm. so i think the more thrillers i can read or the more books or stories i can consume of any genre um hopefully the better i get at writing and the more ideas i'll have when i am when i am writing so um i recently read a um, terrific fantasy novel by Francesca May um, called Wild and Wicked Things and I very rarely read fantasy but when I do I think my god I should do this more so um, Mm. yeah I I do try to step outside of the um, of the circle of thrillers when I can. That's really cool that you like use the analogy of like an Olympic person training because it's kind of similar for like book reviewers too like when we're reviewing books it's kind of like a job because we're like reading through the book and then coming up with our are very like well thought out reviews to share with the world and so yeah there's like there's definitely similarities there but no that's really cool like you're doing active research but you're also enjoying your time doing it and like that's awesome yeah it's it's easy to feel guilty about enjoying (laughs) one part of one's job but um yeah yeah, it's um it's it's a good perk okay so my next question i don't know how many of these are in thriller books but I like to ask this question to authors and it is, what is your favorite book friendship? If you can think of one. Book friendship as in a friendship of characters within the book or, Oh, okay. Um, I would have to, my mind immediately goes to Agatha Christie and the friendship in um, Agatha Christie's Poirot novels between Hercule Poirot and Ariadne Oliver. And I don't know if, have you, if you're familiar with, um, with um, um, the characters, but of course, Hercule Poirot is, um, is the very famous detective. But within um, a certain number of um, Christie's novels about him, there is a character called Ariadne Oliver, who is the most autobiographical character probably anyone has ever written. And, um, well, I don't know, there's probably more, but I, mean, I, you know, I don't want to um, delve too deeply into how much Christie put herself into Ariadne. But Ariadne Oliver in the novels is a best-selling novelist. And the, it's clear sometimes that Christie perhaps maybe using her as a as a mouthpiece for certain frustrations she might have with the, you know, world of publishing or writing and that kind of thing. And um, Ariane Oliver and Poirot join up to solve some crimes, particularly in some of the later books set in the sixties and seventies. And it's such a brilliant friendship because they really play off each other while they're investigating the crimes and um they kind of get irritated with each other but they don't fall out and um it's um it's also refreshing that it's a very asexual relationship there's never any sense that they're going to fall in love or leap into bed with each other or anything like that that's definitely not on the cards they're just very much platonic friendship with a lot of respect for each other whilst also being able to be quite playful and um yeah i really like their their friendship that's awesome that's really cool yeah, I, that's a new one. I haven't had that friendship yeah. come up yet with authors that I've talked to before. I, I thoroughly recommend Halloween Party, Christie's novels Halloween Party. Um, okay. That's a really nice one with both of them. That's a good starting point. All right. I, I have been recommended Agatha Christie by many people. So like I really should dive into her novels. <laughs> um, so my next question is, and feel free to use your own book for this. What is your most anticipated release coming out in the future of 2022? Goodness. Um, well, aside, of course, from, <laughs> from the, Loct- uh, the Loct- Attic, which comes out in November, um, I would, oh, it's really difficult because um, I have a heap of advanced proofs of books that, that are coming out on my shelf and I'm just looking... <laughs> um at them right now so I can remind myself of what because it's really difficult because I get sent these proofs so I completely forget when they actually come mm. out when they have already been published um Helen Fields is a terrific crime writer um her book The Last Girl to Die that comes out in the autumn and um Under the Marsh um, by J.R. Halliday they're two two great crime novels that um, will be coming this either this summer or this autumn so um yeah I'll go mm. with those sounds very exciting um okay so since you're saying that you have piles of books all around you i'm curious to know if you know how many books are in your current tbr pile there are (laughs) i'd say immediate tbr pile and then there's what Mm. i kind of um, 
view as like the legacy TBR pile, which <laughs> is where um, there's there's a brief story actually behind this. I used to work in um, I used to work for the UK book chain Waterstones for their mm-hmm. head office. And I used to do the social media for Waterstones. And when lockdown hit, um, the social media photography, so all the Instagram pictures of nice new books and that kind of thing, had to change from me doing it in the office to me doing it in my home. And so the deliveries of books were kind of redirected to my house. And I would receive tons of books from publishers constantly week after week. And um, I uh, I left um, that job just over a year ago to um to write full time but um the books remained because they were just here there were so many of them so i have absolutely tons of like gorgeous hardbacks that i'm desperate to get to but of course more new, new ones arrive as well and they lovely publishers send me new ones to read so those start to get shifted to the back so i'd say in terms of kind of live immediate tbrs i think i've probably got about between 15 and 20 new kind of staring up at the shelves 15 and 20 new hardbacks um or upcoming releases that i've got um, waiting for you to read and then probably about 300 400 <laughs> more other books yeah. that i should get around to at some point but um yeah it's difficult it's, it's the temptation of the new isn't it when a new one arrives you're like oh, i want to get to this one first yeah i mean there's there's no shame in having a huge tbr pile i know all about that 15 yeah. to 20 is actually a pretty good size for like your immediate pile that's pretty yeah. good <laughs> thank yeah. you no, I, I do, like, have a lot as well. I would say it's probably in the 300 to 400. <laughs> Although, for me, I'm I'm kind of the one where, like, I'll buy new books and then immediately put them on the shelf and still read the books. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's easy to do. I buy books that I've been sent proofs of simply because I'm, I'm very terrible, I'm terrible at this, but I really like the feel of, like, a proper hardback or a new paperback, um, whereas proofs um, come usually in quite, you know, floppy paper and that kind of thing understandably because i want to just send them out quickly to um to authors but i really like the feel of like a fresh new paperback or a fresh new hardback so i still end up buying them in the shops when i see them that's good that's still like you're still supporting the authors in that way yeah, too. That's that's awesome. it's, yeah that's the plus side okay let me check out my other questions here so next question is who is your favorite author oh, gosh this is another really tough one um <laughs> i it's very tricky actually because I find I gravitate towards certain books rather than certain authors there's um, like certain books I'd say are um, like my key favorite books of all time but um, I may not have read the other books by that author and um, that they've produced and rather criminally Um, but I'd say probably I think it goes between Jane Austen, Agatha Christie and if we choose a living author potentially Tana French I think um I'd say they um I was about to say they're the authors I'd read if they released a new book but Jane Austen hasn't um got anything on the upcoming releases pile um but yeah Tana French is an author I'd say I'd buy her books immediately as soon as um as soon as they're they're published or Donna's Heart as well awesome very cool yeah I have not heard of Tana French but I'll have oh my to gosh up now <laughs> yes you should read her novel The Witch Helm I think that is up there with possibly my favorite book ever yeah it's, okay. it's an incredible novel that and Donna Tartt's The Secret History both of those I'd say are up there with the best all right well I'll have to I, I think I have actually oh no I have Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch on my shelf down there but not The Secret History I don't have that one but yeah I'll have to look them up um, okay, so my other question I wanted to know is, how did you start writing? I started writing um, because I would I wanted to do something creative once I'd finished my um, degree. I did um, film in English at um, university for my undergrad, and then for my postgrad master's, I did film and cultural management. And I really loved both degrees, but both of them were almost entirely based around studying stories um, in a theoretical way rather rather than writing them. Um, They weren't creative writing courses. And particularly my film and cultural management masters was to do with essentially packaging stories up and how do we sell them and how do we distribute them and market them and that kind of thing. And um, it was all kind of geared to me potentially going into film marketing as a a career. But I kind of knew that I wanted to make up stories myself. And um, part of me was to continue down the film route and potentially go into film production. But um, film production, of course, involved 
involves a lot of other people's time and money whereas if it's just you writing a book it is just your time and money you're you're using mm-hmm. or potentially wasting but um, of, of course it's, it's never a waste but um i i found the idea of writing a novel less scary than necessarily than making a film so i came up i had an idea for a novel and um, my parents were really lovely they um allowed me to kind of basically live at home as soon as i graduated and I worked in a bookshop at weekends but during the week I just I just wrote and um, that book didn't get me an agent and the one after that I wrote didn't get me an agent but the third one I wrote that did get me an agent and that's the one that ended up becoming my debut so um, yeah it was it was a long road to it but um, yeah it was worth it of course. Yeah that's really cool that like you kind of knew in in the back of your mind that like you wanted to be that creative outlet and then went for it and actually did it like that's very cool and I give you props for putting yourself out there and working hard to get to where you are now that's very impressive thank you yes <laughs> it can feel um, up and down at the time but um but yeah no it's, it's... yeah but it clearly worked out in the end which is awesome um so another thing I like to ask authors is if you have a favorite reading spot Yes, I do. And actually, this is an interesting one. This is new, a newfound reading spot. Um, I, um, um, as I mentioned before, I alluded to the idea that I like to kind of um, count reading as, as part of my work. And I was, I was having a bit of a tough time of making sure I did that. I, every year I take myself at least once off for what I call a reading retreat. And um, this isn't any kind of like pre-established reading retreat. This is literally me booking myself into a nice hotel and sitting by the pool and reading for a week. And I, I kind of just do it as a gift to myself. And I, I go that I write as well on there or come up with ideas. So it's kind of, uh, you know, enforced work to some extent. And I always come away from that thinking, oh, I wish I could do that all the time. It's just so wonderful. Whereas when I'm at home and I'm, sitting down to read I always end up thinking oh I should put some laundry on or I really need to hoover or I should tidy or I should do something else and it's very easy to get distracted and um I I think I've just cracked this relatively recently I now um over this past month or two I take myself off to a coffee shop in the high street near where I live um every afternoon I go swimming at lunchtime and then once I'm back from swimming I get my book and I go to the coffee shop and I read from probably about 1 32 p.m all the way up to about 5 30 or 6 when they close so I get a good kind of four or five solid hours of reading every day and of course there are some days that's not possible there are some days I have you know other things to do but generally speaking on a normal writing day that will be my place to read. I will go to a coffee shop and read. And I just love the ambience, really. It's, um, it's so much better than silence. It's, um, and I did actually catch myself trying to fake it by getting YouTube um, <laughs> coffee shop ambience on YouTube yeah. and putting that on, thinking that will help me mm-hmm. concentrate. And I thought, why am I actually faking this? I can actually go to a real, a real place with real humans. So um, I've been doing that, and that has now become my favourite place to read although the air conditioning is aggressive in there so i have to wear knitwear when i, when yeah, I go there that's fair. no that's that's really cool i i love the idea of going on a reading retreat because whenever i go on vacations like that's all i really want to do is just like if i'm in a tropical place i just want to sit on the beach and read or i don't know if i'm in a cold place i want to sit in a warm spot and read but it's just like it's such a cool idea that that's what you do you just take time to actually read and it also sounds fantastic that you get so much time in a day to read as well um i also personally enjoy reading at coffee shops i i agree like i find the ambience of like just the background noise and the smell of the coffee shop like all of that mixed together is just a perfect blend to like tune out and zone into a book i don't know it's just it's a great feeling yeah, um, yeah, it really is. It's just gifting yourself that time in the day and making space for it is just the best. Yeah, it's the best thing, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now that it's the summer season here in Canada, I'm taking to sitting outside on our, we have like a deck in our backyard. So I'll sit out there with like a nice glass of lemonade or something and read for a couple hours in the evening when I, can, when I get off work, because I'm still currently working from home, but I'm going to be going back to the office this week. So I'm excited to get out of the house and socialize. <laughs> Uh, exactly yeah it's also very cool that you do swimming do you like you just swim laps back and forth yeah I do yeah just lane swimming um I actually think um it's such an important part of my process even without me realizing it because 
because I've spent all the morning writing, I find I mentally digest all the things that I've written probably earlier that day and other plot things I may need to think through. And it's part of my day that doesn't involve a screen or distraction. Mm -hmm which is mm -hmm. so rare these days. And um, I mean, even when I've like, taken myself off to read, I'll end up checking Twitter or emails or something on my phone. Whereas, of course, this can't happen in a swimming pool. So um, not yet, so I'm sure they'll invent a way. But um, I, I really like the idea that it entirely separates me off from the outside world just for 20 minutes, half an hour. And I think that is really important in just letting me kind of just think through without any kind of forced like process behind it necessarily that I'm like actively you know deciding to do but just allow things to kind of settle that I've um, written that morning and think about what I might need to write next yeah no swimming swimming laps is definitely like super therapeutic and you can kind of like zone out as you're doing your laps and just like think and like I, I swim laps too I haven't done it in a long time because our like pool facility here where I live is I don't think it's open right now um but I used to swim laps a lot pre-pandemic. So I, I totally understand. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me see here. I just have a couple more questions and then we'll be able to wrap up. So my next question is how long have you been an author? I've been an author since um, I've been a published author. I'm trying to think. I, I got my publishing deal in uh, my first book contract in 2018 and my debut came out the following year. So it took about a year on from, um, from the contract being signed. So yeah, the first book came out in 2019. And um, as I said, the pandemic has just kind of shifted my whole perspective of time, but I think that makes <laughs> it about, about three years, I think. Um, yes, yeah, it's just over three years. Next question is, what do you like about reading? I like the fact that it, um, it enables or at least provides a space to confront experiences, events, situations, characters um, that I almost definitely won't encounter in, in my own life. And um, some of them I will, but um, there'll be many experiences or types of people or situations or even settings or countries that I you know, will never encounter. And it, it provides a place for that to be encountered and also within the safe space of pages that can be closed if one wishes. Um, so I like the fact that it is the literal kind of time travel device to some extent um, where you can encounter all these things um, and um, within, within the space of the book. And if you don't like it, you can choose another. Yeah, it is very cool that it's, it's such an immersive space, yet you're <laughs> solitary and sitting in like a room not actually going anywhere, but in your mind, like you're going to so many places. So like, I think that's really cool. One more thing on that, actually. I love also that it's quantifiable and this sounds really strange, but I love the satisfying feeling of seeing the list of books that you've got through that year or that month or whatever and feeling the achievement in that. That sounds very strange, but yeah, there's no. the quantifiable nature as well. I 100% agree with you. And I think every book nerd also agrees with you on that statement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have one final question and then one bonus question that I wanted to ask. So my final question is if you could explain your, or not explain, if you could write your self as a book title, what would your book title be? Um, worried. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, I think, I think, um, yeah, I think I, I do worry a lot about, um, about so much, particularly about the writing process, whether I'm doing it right. About the whole publishing world about you know if the books um, people will like them if they'll sell everything like that and but to some extent that I think is what makes good fiction particularly good thriller fiction is that um it's, it's like that thing about it allowing space to be like to confront things one might necessarily won't like and um all of fiction to some extent is conflict and doubt and um in in our lives we're frequently being pushed towards kind of yes and no right and wrong everything's very kind of like these very set categories um whereas of course life isn't actually like that and thrillers allow people to experience that doubt and that worry and you know everything like that on the page um so yeah i'm ho hopeful it doesn't sound like too much of a negative um negative word optimistic hopefully we'll go with that one instead <laughs> optimistic 
<laughs> no, that's that, that's good. That's totally fine. Lots of authors will give like the most random answers for their book title, and a lot of them are adjectives. So <laughs> that's totally fine. Um, okay, so my last bonus question was, because you have such a prominent candle collection behind you, I have to know what your favorite scent is. I think, um, and I don't think it's behind me. Um, oh, there's two, and I'll go with the other one. One of them is called Haunted Hayride. They're both Halloween scents. One's called <laughs> Haunted Hayride, and because um, we don't we don't have these hayrides in the um, in the UK. Do you have hayrides in Canada? Yeah, we do. I'd never heard of them until Yankee brought out a candle called Haunted Hayride, and then I googled <laughs> and they found they were things done at kind of market festivals and um, Halloween things, and then I d discovered them in Hallmark movies, so I now know what they are. Um, but <laughs> Haunted Hayride is this amazing kind of vocative kind of um, mystical scent. It's very kind of woodsy. Um, whereas this other one, this is my other favorite, is Trick or Treat. And you can see the Ooh. cat there and a nice pumpkin there. And this one's like really spicy. It's sweet, but it's got a spicy kick to it. It's slightly piney, but cinnamony. And this for me is the absolute scent of autumn. And autumn is like my favorite, favorite season um, and Christmas, but they kind of lean into each other. But, um, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to probably go with them um, with trick or treat, I think. Okay, right on. Well, autumn is a great season. Yes. Um, okay, so well, with that, I guess we'll wrap up. So thanks for joining me on my channel. And Very much for having me on. It's been lovely. Yeah, no, it was great. It was really cool getting to know you more as, as an author. And I'm very excited to see what your books are like. Um, so with that, everybody that is watching, I will put all of Barnaby's stuff in the description down below. So like all the information to get his books. So you can check that out as well. And I'll put your, are you okay with me putting your social media in the description? Yeah, yeah do go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And so with that, I guess we will see you next time. Wonderful.